it, it is shaping up to be a cool, cool weekend in the life of our church. We got to, we got to celebrate 50 years of ministry last night. Thank you, uh, everybody who, who had a hand in that and everybody who came and celebrated with us. We had just a, a wonderful evening together. And, and this morning, we're starting to see uh, pledge cards come in for our On Purpose project. Uh, we're, we're grateful for that. If you, if you brought yours in with you today, you can pin it up to the board uh, that we've got out in the lobby. Don't worry. Nobody's going to take those off and look and see what you did. Um, it's just our way, because again, we're not, we're not celebrating together a, a, a dollar number. We're celebrating together the number of people who just say, yes, Lord, I trust you, and I want to be a part of, of this church body moving forward. And so uh, we got a lot to be thankful for, and so I just want to open us up before we get into the message this morning with a, just a prayer of thankfulness. So would you, would you go to God in prayer with me? Father God, we, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for being our God. We thank you for being the, the, the maker of heaven and earth, Lord, and, and the giver of life, Lord, that we can be here, Lord, today with, with breath in our lungs and, and, Lord, to be experiencing another day that you have given us, Lord. We are thankful to you for that, Lord God. As a church, we are, we are thankful to, uh, to have celebrated this 50-year this milestone, Lord God, 50 years of just your faithfulness working in and through people who have been a part of Sarasota Christian Church, Lord, changing our lives and, and working through us to, to, to change the lives of those around us that they might know Jesus and know life. Lord, we just ask and pray that you would give us fruitful years to come, Lord, that, that we would continue to build on the foundation that has been laid for us, Lord, and, and continue just, to, just sharing the love and the hope of Jesus with the world around us. God, I thank you for uh, the, the faithfulness of, of every person who has just said, God, I want to trust you. And, and in, in this one way, I want to trust you, Lord, with the resources you've given me to help our church with some projects we need to, to help us be healthy and, and move forward. Lord God, I thank you for that and, and continue to pray, Lord, that you would, just, um, you would just build our trust in you and, Lord, that you would allow us to, to, to reap a, a fruit of spiritual growth, Lord. Lord, because we trust you and we know that all we have comes from you. We thank you for your word and, and pray that you would just open up our hearts and open up our minds to encounter you in it today, Lord Jesus. We ask and pray all of these things in your name. Amen. So about seven years ago, a guy named Martin Blenkow uh, used a connection that he had with a professional football player to surprise a friend of his who had just become a, a father for the first time. Uh, this, this, this pro football player, he filmed a video of himself sending a congratulations, kind of out of the blue, to this person he didn't know, Martin's friend, uh, just as, a, as kind of a surprising, like, wow, I'm already having this special moment. And then this famous person reaches out to me and it just makes it, uh, you know, that little bit more special. And, uh, and Martin and a, and a buddy of his, they realized that maybe they were on to something here, and so they started a business based around this idea. It's a, it's a business called Cameo. And it's a website where, where different, you know, varying levels of famous people can kind of put themselves out there and for a fee are willing to send these personalized videos to people. Whether it's a, it's a happy birthday or a congratulations for a big event and, you know, it, it, again, it, some people... A little famous, some people very famous, and for different amounts of money, who are willing to sell this, who are willing to, to send these videos out, and and thousands now, thousands of, of of varying you know famous people have have signed up and said, yeah, we'll 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 do this for for a certain fee, and and it, Cameo was named a couple of years ago. They were they were named one of the world's most innovative companies, all based on this idea that people would value hearing personally from someone that they had admired only from a distance. And I mean, I mean, people sometimes spend like hundreds of dollars on these videos, and it, it just got me thinking, I mean, what if we could have a message from Jesus? And, and not because somebody paid him to wish us happy birthday, <laughs> but because he, he wanted to talk to us, because because we, as his followers, as the, the people that he died for, 
Because he had something important to tell us. Well, this morning we're, we're starting a new teaching series, and it's called Dear Church, Love Jesus. And we're going to be looking at a collection of messages from Jesus for us. Now, obviously, he didn't send them directly to our phones, and we didn't pull them out of the, the church's mailbox outside, but they are, are letters that he delivered to us through the Apostle John, who recorded them in chapters 2 and 3 of the book of Revelation. And even though these, these seven letters, they've got the names of ancient churches on their address labels, they are really messages that Jesus sent for his whole church through all time, including us today. I mean, the Christians in, in John's day, if we think a little bit about what their experience was, they lived in a culture where they were outsiders, where they were trying to live very differently from the people around them, and it was not popular. The law in their society was increasingly stacking against them. The, their, their, the spread of their beliefs, their influence on society, it, 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 their, their government did not want to tolerate that. Just, just wearing the name Christian was something that could, that could bring trial into your life. And that was just what was going on outside of their church communities. They had just as big problems within their faith gatherings. <laughs> they, they, they had to deal with, with, with people and all of the issues that come with as they were battling to actually live out what they said they believed. Does any of that sound familiar to us today? I mean, many of us have seen in our lifetime, our society go from being one that was, that was positive about Christianity to one that is very negative about it. We, we have seen uh, persecution on the rise. And now granted, not maybe to the level that John was experiencing or that some of our brothers and, and sisters experience around the world, but the slope, it's pointed that direction. And that's just what's external. We, too, have, have our internal issues in the church. Churches face a, face a host of problems. There, there are people who, who, who are hurtful and sometimes even abusive to, to church members who, just, who are just trying to trust. We have apathy towards some of the, the behaviors that, that Jesus said were most important for his people to be to becoming like. And what we could use in the midst of this for sure is to hear from Jesus. And that's exactly what we find in these letters to the churches in Revelation. We get to hear Jesus praise his church for where she's getting it right. And we, we get to hear him rebuke her for where she's gotten off track. And we get to see him give give guidance and give encouragement to where she needs support. And all of it is for us if we're willing to listen. We're going to hear this refrain over and over again in the coming weeks. And it's, let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. If you've, if you've ever parented or worked with teenagers, you know what it's like to have your words heard but not listened to. And I'm, that's, that, no offense meant to teenagers, I was, a, I was a youth pastor in the beginning of my ministry. I love that age group and all of us who are adults, we were there when we were that age. Some of us haven't grown out of it. <laughs> Jesus is saying to his church, I have the words to help you if you're willing to receive them. So the question is, are we? Now before we get into the messages from Jesus, we will jump into that next week. Um, this morning, we're going to start in Revelation chapter 1. We're going to start by looking at the messenger, because Jesus, he, present, he presents himself in Revelation 1 a little differently than he does in some other places in Scripture. 
He sets a tone for, for the messages that he has for his church in the next two chapters. So if you've got a Bible or if you've got a Bible app, I'd love for you to open up with me to Revelation chapter 1. And we're going to start in verse 9. It says, I, John, your brother and partner in the affliction, kingdom, and endurance that are in Jesus was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. This is John, this is, this is John the disciple. This is, this is John who was, who was called out of his Galilean fishing boat by Jesus, who was called out of his own plans for his life to instead come and follow Jesus and to, to go fish for people. This is John, who was a witness to Jesus' ministry, who spent three years walking with him and hearing his teaching and seeing his miracles. This this is John, who who stood at the foot of the cross next to Jesus' mother as he saw his friend and teacher die. This is John, who then got to be a witness to Jesus risen to life again. John, who became a leader in the early church. John, who who wrote a gospel about the life and ministry of Jesus so that many more might come to believe and find life in his name. John was an old man at this point. And he, he had seen his fellow disciples martyred in persecutions, it, it, tradition tells us that it wasn't for lack of trying that John wasn't killed himself. But because he just continued to work, press forward the message of Jesus, he had been exiled to this island called Patmos. And he writes here as a brother in the affliction, in kingdom, and endurance that are all a part of following Jesus. Now, if you're new around here, if we haven't gotten to know each other very well, you, you need to know about me that I, I'm really not down with the bait and switch of Christianity sometimes. Following Jesus, it is a meaningful life. I believe it's a more meaningful life than you could find in anything else. It is a joyful life. When you throw yourself completely into it, it is a life with an eternal hope that you will not find anywhere else. And it is not a cakewalk. And, and if anybody tells you that, that comfort or health or ease, that those things are just yours to be had if you just have enough faith, or that those things should even be the target for the life of a Christian... They either haven't read the Bible very closely, or they just didn't like what they saw there. You know, somebody came up to me and told me, you know what I really want? I want to be a millionaire football player, but I don't ever want to have to run. And I don't want to get hit, and I don't want to have to hit anybody else. I would say, well, actually, you don't want to be a football player at all. You just want the money. And there, there may be people who, who want the, the meaning and who want the joy and who want the eternity, but being a Christian means affliction and needing to endure for the sake of God's kingdom. It may very well cost you everything. And what you gain is worth everything it may cost. And John, having experienced that, he he goes on writing. He says, I was was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, probably probably having some some kind of prayer time, worship time. He was connecting with God. And I heard a loud voice behind me like a trumpet saying, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. These were seven cities in the Roman province of Asia. This would be, this would be much of modern-day Turkey. And, and these 
seven churches. We, we aren't really given a reason why these seven are the specific addressees, but it's the use of that number seven that actually tells us that this is, these are our messages meant for the entire church. Throughout the book of Revolu- Revolution, throughout the book of Revelation, throughout this book, John uses that number seven again and again, and, and it's, a, it's a number that is a symbol of, of all of something or, or completeness. The fact that there are seven churches being written to, it indicates that they are standing in for all of God's church, including us. So John hears this, this loud voice from behind him. And then I turned to see whose voice it was that spoke to me. I'm going to spoil it. It was Jesus. But, but I wonder, like, what, what image comes into our head when we think about turning around and, and seeing Jesus standing there? Now, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe you get an image in your head that looks a little something like this one. Uh, I, I, I've, I've affectionately nicknamed this guy, you know, sort of classic Euro Jesus. Uh, it, it, did anybody have this picture or a picture like this in their house or in their church growing up? We did. We had it. Um, it's, he's, he's, very, he's very soft. He's very, he's very well-groomed. Even his flowing hair is lovely. Maybe, maybe you're a little more uh, on, the, on kind of the practical realist side. Maybe, maybe you get a, an image in your head that looks something more like this. Uh, this was a few years back, several years back, there were a group of scholars who, who tried to come up with a composite of what a, what a first century Palestinian man might have looked like, like more of his skin color, more of his hairstyle, and maybe this is what somebody, you know, somebody in Jesus' age might have, have looked like back in his day. Or I don't know, maybe, maybe you would be expecting this. Maybe you would expect to see, you know, Jonathan Rumi. He's portraying Jesus in the, in the TV series The Chosen. I know we got some fans of the show in here. Well, whatever image might come to mind when you think of Jesus, John's about to see something a little different. When I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was one like the Son of Man dressed in a robe and with a golden sash wrapped around his chest. The hair of his head was white as wool, white as snow, and his eyes like a fiery flame. His feet were like fine bronze as it is fired in a furnace, and his voice like the sound of cascading waters. He had seven stars in his right hand, A sharp, double-edged sword came from his mouth, and his face was shining like the sun at full strength. It's not exactly Euro-Jesus, is it? Now, we're not going to, in this series, get into some of the more imagery-heavy sections of the book of Revelation that kind of come after chapter 3, where we're stopping, but... You need to know that when you're reading the book of Revelation, John pulls phrase after phrase after phrase from the Old Testament of the Bible. He he pulls phrases from from prophets like Daniel and Ezekiel. He, He draws from encounters that people like Moses and others had with God. And so for those of us who you know, often maybe don't know our Old Testament quite as well as they would have back then, um, we can read some of these images and they come across to us as really weird. And they are really weird a lot of the times. But also, those who knew their Old Testament, they would have read a lot of this and also said it's very familiar. Oh, I recognize those symbols. Those are from Daniel or from these other places. And it's, it's because of that that we can maybe, maybe see some of the mystery, some of the weirdness taken out of that. Because we can go back to those moments in the Old Testament and get an understanding of what it is John is trying to convey to us here. Now, the, the seven lampstands is, is where he starts, is what John sees first. The seven lampstands that, that, are, that Jesus is there um, in the midst of. Verse 20 of this chapter tells us that those seven lampstands are just the seven churches. 
that, that are being addressed here. Which means that John is seeing Jesus, not as he was during his time on earth, but John is seeing Jesus as he stands among his church today. Like when we think about Jesus now, this is Jesus in all his glory. This is probably more the image that we should have of Jesus when we think of him today among his church. He looks like a, a son of man, which means he looks like a person. But it, it was this person that was also, again, prophetically talked about in the book of Daniel. It was this Messiah figure that he had prophesied. It was a title that Jesus used for himself during his earthly ministry to let people know that I'm human, but I am also something more, something divine. The white hair that he had, his white hair, it was a picture of ancientness. And don't take offense to that if you've got white hair, okay? Because, because that ancientness, it was, it was a symbol of wisdom. If anybody ever gives you a hard time about your white hair, just say, I am letting my wisdom show, <laughs> okay? <laughs> this, was, this was John seeing Jesus in his ancient wisdom. The, the eyes like fiery flame. That's another image from the book of Daniel. And I want us to remember, like, when it says things like, I heard a voice like a trumpet, or his eyes were like fiery flame, John is being symbolic. He is not saying that the figure that he saw literally had torches for eyeballs. He's trying to describe a quality that he experienced of this being. It, it, fire, fire has a, a purifying and a refining quality to it. We use it to, we use it to sterilize. We use it to purify and this is John's way of saying that like, like Jesus had this gaze that could burn a hole right through you. Like if any of you, if any of you had a mom who like if you were trying to get away with something, all she had to do was look at you and she knew what you were trying to get away with. Like she could just like tear you down with her gaze like she knew. John's saying like that's what it was like being under the gaze of Jesus. Likewise, his, his feet were like fine bronze as it is fired in a furnace. There was something, there was like something active happening here where, where his feet were already fine, his feet were already purified, but there as he was walking, as he was standing amidst his church, there was a, there was a purifying action happening as though, as though he was there to actively purify his church with his pure foundation. His voice says that it was like the sound of, of cascading waters. And that's an image of God that we get from the book of Ezekiel. And I, I, I thought I'd try to describe it to you, but what's, what's the saying? A picture's worth a thousand words, and I guess a video is even better than that. So um, this is, Ashley and I took a video when we were at Niagara Falls like five years ago. So just take this. It's loud, right? Kind of drowns everything out. Hard to focus on anything else. Just this overwhelming sound of Jesus' voice. It overwhelmed John. Its presence, it drowned out all other noise. You know, if you've ever been there, you know that you've got to kind of shout to be heard. You've got you to lean in. You feel like you're constantly leaning in to talk to each other when you're in the presence of, of something like that. John says that, that, that Jesus, he had seven stars in his hand. And that's, that's something that we, we see um, one meaning from just the picture of it, and then we're given another meaning of it from Jesus in verse 20. The picture that you just see, I mean, when you see someone who is holding celestial bodies in their hand, this is someone who is sovereign over the greatest things of the universe. That he is in control in that way. And then in, in verse 20 at the end of the chapter, Jesus explains further that these seven stars are the angels of the seven churches that he's writing to. 
An angel was, was a messenger. And actually, in, in Greek, it, it, could be, it could be a human messenger. We think angel, and we automatically think of a heavenly being. But they actually use the word for human messengers and spiritual messengers. Book of Revelation pretty much always uses it as spiritual messengers. So we kind of figure that's what's going on here. But, but what he's saying is that the, the, the church, the, the God, that Jesus is holding the, those who are speaking to the church. He's holding the messengers to the church in his hand. When we gather together, we're doing something physical here, but we're doing something spiritual that's being represented before God. And, and, and Jesus, he's, he's got control of that. John saw Jesus then with a, as, as there as he is standing in the midst of his church with a, with a sword coming from his mouth. You know, this goes beyond just the, the sound that we've already heard, that we've already talked about. But the words himself, the words he spoke could pierce as we know that the word of God can. The, the word of God can lay us open. It, it bears our souls. The, the word of God reveals to us our sinful inclinations. It reveals to us our need for God. And at the same time, the word of God fights for us. It, it, it fights to refine us. It fights against uh, the lies of our enemy who would condemn us. And we need to listen to it. Finally, John says that his, his face was shining like the sun at Full strength, which I, I, I think that John saved this one for the end just to say, you know what? I've given you the best description that I can, but I could not look at him for very long. I mean, if you've ever had the, the, the fullness of the sun just like hit you in the eyes when you were driving or I don't know, maybe you're one of those fun people who just decided to stare at it for some reason, like you know you can't do it for very long. Friends, we have a tendency, especially in our, you know, our, our Western, non-denominational style churches that, you know, sometimes we, and, and this is, okay, so sometimes we kind of we come into worship and, and, and we come kind of casual. You know, we, we bring in our, our, our cup of coffee, we kind of roll in, and, and hey, I'm, I'm not saying don't bring in a cup of coffee, I brought one in this morning, uh, <laughs> but... But we, we treat Jesus, you know, as, as, as though, you know, we're very, we're very friendly with him, as, as, as though Jesus is kind of here on our level. If, if I may, kind of like he's, kind of like he's a cuddly Jesus. And, and I want you to hear this. Like, nothing about that is wrong. Jesus is a friend. Jesus is approachable. Jesus is comforting. We shouldn't think of him as, as distant and cold and hard. But we also shouldn't forget that Jesus is almighty God. He is holy. He is sovereign. He is not someone to be taken lightly. Sometimes our, our approach to him is, 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 is a little too casual, and maybe, maybe in the ways that we think we might be displeasing him. Oh, Jesus doesn't like it when I talk like that, or, or Jesus doesn't like it when I do that, but hey, you're going to have to let that one slide, buddy. And sometimes we, 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 we treat him not the way we should. We don't seek his wisdom like we should. We don't, we don't look for the way he might be doing a purifying work in the midst of our difficulties. We just complain about him. When things aren't going well, we think, well, man, if, if I could see Jesus right now, I'd have a thing or two to say to him. You know, I, I, I've, got a, I've got a couple of questions for this Jesus. Why doesn't he just show up right now so I can ask my questions? And that's how we think. No, I think we would do exactly what John does. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. Just boom. Knocked to the ground in the presence of his holiness. In the presence of his purity. Couldn't even look at it. Couldn't even stand. And then, of course, Jesus. Because even as Jesus stands in all of his glory, he is so loving, 
He is so compassionate. John says, he laid his right hand on me. And he said, don't be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. I was dead. But look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Therefore, write what you have seen, what is, and what will take place after this. This visually terrifying Jesus, he reaches out to John and he comforts him and he reminds him of the gospel. I mean, what we are seeing here is Jesus in all his victory. John, remember who I am. I have always been. I am God Almighty. And I came and I died. But I live again forevermore. And now your enemy, the last enemy, death, I've got control over that, John. And and he doesn't say it here, but John says somewhere else that whoever believes in me will not perish, doesn't have to worry about death, but will have eternal life. That's going to be the point of Jesus' message to his church that we're going to see in the coming weeks. It's the one that he commissions John to write down and to send to these churches, to those who have ears to listen. He says those who will, who will listen, those who will receive what the victorious Jesus has to say, well, those Christians, those churches, they will overcome the darkness of their times. They will endure the affliction that they are going through and they will have the hope of eternal life. Just keep your eyes on the victorious Jesus. My son, he he had a basketball game last Saturday and uh, the other team unfortunately only had four kids show up. So, So my son's team got the win before they ever put the ball into play. Now, they went ahead and played because kids want to play the game, but, but the outcome of the game was already decided before it started. You know, all that was left to really figure out was what the box score was going to look like, who was going to be there on the list, and, 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 and what their stats would look like at the end of the game. Church, as Jesus stands among us today, He has already won. He is already victorious, church. All that's left to be determined is who is going to stand in victory with him and what it's going to look like getting there. And so, church, today, my my encouragement for us is to fix our eyes on Jesus as he stands among us today. Consider his wisdom his purity, his refining work, and his mighty voice. And commit yourself to receiving what it is he has to say to our church so that we might stand in victory with him. Friends, we're going to have a couple of minutes of reflection like we always do at this time. It's a time for communion. It's a time for prayer. And church, I just want to encourage us to pray a prayer of surrender today. We don't love that word, surrender, because surrender to us sounds like defeat When it comes to Jesus, surrender is not defeat. Surrender is simply leaving the losing team and joining the winning team. 
And as we read these messages to the churches, Jesus might ask us to surrender some things to him. And I just want us to take this time to pray that he would prepare our hearts for that, that he would prepare our minds to hear what he might say in the coming weeks. And we're going to take communion. This is this is a, a moment that Jesus gave his church to remember his death, to defeat death. We take a little piece of bread that reminds us of his body that was nailed to the cross. And we drink from a cup that reminds us of his blood poured out. And we say thank you. And if you're here today and you've never made the decision to follow Jesus... Maybe, maybe that word surrender sounds a little rough to you, but, but just the idea of, of this Jesus who is already victorious and you being able to live a life of hope and victory with him, if that sounds like something you want to know more about, well, today after service, you know, I'm going to hang out here down by the front of the stage where I always do, and I would love to talk to you more about what it means to follow Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, again, we love you and we give you thanks for, we give you thanks for your word. Jesus, I thank you that you are a God who, who showed up, revealed yourself to John in the way that maybe we don't always see you, Lord Jesus, but the way that we should. Mighty, pure, awesome in power, and loving, and comforting and preaching the words of life to all of us who need to hear them. Lord, I pray that you would prepare our hearts, prepare our minds for what you have to say to your church. Lord, where we need to be encouraged, I pray that we would be ready to be encouraged. Where we need to be corrected, I pray we would be ready to be corrected. Lord, because we don't, we don't want to be half in this Christian life. Lord, I pray that we would be wholeheartedly pursuing after you, Jesus. We thank you for giving your life for us on that cross. For dying so that we might never have to know death. So that we could have the hope of life and life forever. We pray these things in your name, Lord Jesus.